Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Professor Stuart Corbridge, Vice Chancellor, Durham University. Professor Brian Copeland, Pro Vice Chancellor and Campus Principal, the UWI St. Augustine. Members of the Diplomatic Corps, members of the Campus Executive Management Team, Dr. Darren Conrad, Chair of the Morning's Panel, members of the Campus Community, panelists, presenters, and other specially invited guests, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming this morning to attend this Sir Arthur Lewis Memorial Symposium. My name is Hamid Ghani. I'm the director of the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute for Social and Economic Studies, and it is indeed a pleasure to welcome you here this morning. Today we celebrate the birthday, or what would have been the birthday, of Sir William Arthur Lewis, who lived during the period 23rd January 1915 to the 15th of June 1991. He was a native of St. Lucia, who won the Nobel Prize for Economics in 1979. And at the time of winning the Nobel Prize, he was the James Madison Professor of Political Economy at Princeton University. Lewis graduated from the London School of Economics and Political Science in 1937 with a Bachelor of Commerce degree first class honors, and also a PhD in Industrial Economics in 1940 from the London School of Economics and Political Science. He also taught there and later resigned his position as a reader in colonial economics to take up a chair in economics at the University of Manchester in 1948, where he held Stanley Jevons' chair in political economy. In 1949, he published The Principles of Economic Planning, which was a study prepared for the Fabian Society in the United Kingdom. In 1950, he published Industrial Development in the British West Indies in Caribbean Economic Review. In 1954, he wrote a seminal piece entitled Economic Development with Unlimited Supplies of Labor in the Manchester School, Volume 22, May 1954. This article was followed in 1955 by the publication of a book entitled The Theory of Economic Growth that was published by George Allen and Unwin in London. 1957, he took up a position as United Nations Economic Advisor to the Prime Minister Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana's first year of independence. He later served the United Nations as Deputy Managing Director of its special fund before becoming the first West Indian principal of the University College of the West Indies in 1959, which had been established by Royal Charter in 1948. This therefore makes it our 70th anniversary year. And in 1962, he became the first vice chancellor of the University of the West Indies, which was the successor to the University College of the West Indies. In 1963, he became Professor of Economics and International Affairs at the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University, and later became the James Madison Professor of Political Economy. Another of his famous works, Politics in West Africa, published in 1965, offered a unique insight into the emergence of new states in West Africa that had recently become independent at that time, 1965. He did not confine himself to English-speaking countries, and he also probed those that had managed, uh, that had emerged from colonial rule under other imperial powers. The reality is that Arthur Lewis was a man of many parts. He came from this region, he was one of us, he walked among us in laying the foundations of this university, so that where we are today, in many respects, we owe an incredible debt of gratitude to the man, William Arthur Lewis, whose birthday we would celebrate today and for whom the University of the West Indies has deemed it fit to name today Sir Arthur Lewis Day. So that there are events here, there are events at Cavill, and there are events at Mona. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention. I'd now like to invite our campus principal, Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Brian Copeland uh, to address us this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ghani. Uh, let me get the formalities going. 
and say welcome to Professor Stuart Corbridge, uh, who's Vice Chancellor at Durham University, who's with us here this morning, and our guest speaker tonight, members of the Diplomatic Corps, members of the um, <coughs> I'm sorry, campus's executive management team. I uh, did mention already Dr. Hamid Ghani, who is director of the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute, Institute of Social and Economic Studies, or SALISIS. Uh, I'm not sure if Dr. Darren Conrad is here, who's chaired this morning's proceedings. Panelists, presenters, and other specially invited guests, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, again, good morning. So I'm um, extremely pleased to welcome you to St. Augustine campus. I see many young faces here. Um, that opens up a great prospect for the future. And I'd like to also welcome you to this one day symposium on the life and work of South and Lewis. As Dr. Ghani said, the university will this year be celebrating its 70th year of service and leadership to the people of the Caribbean. As one of only two regional universities globally, this institution has been and continues to be completely committed to enhancing every aspect of Caribbean development and improving the well-being of people in the region. We have, from 1940 to now, it started in 1948, UE has set a remarkable track record in the development of the Caribbean and its people who have come through colonial times, through independence to today, and certainly will move on to a great future. It is certainly apropos that we kick off this year by celebrating Sartre's life and work because it's, his early experience gives us some indication of the gap that the UE filled all those decades ago. While Arthur Lewis left school at 14, having completed his full curriculum, he could only sit the examination for a St. Lucia government scholarship uh, to a British university when he turned 17. I think I saw somewhere that he worked in the civil service during that, that time. He won the uh, scholarship and found himself in a quandary since his dream then was to be an engineer like me. <laughs> According to his autobiography, however, in Nobel Lectures, Economics, 1969-1980, the British government had imposed a color bar in its colonies. So young blacks went in only for law uh, or medicine, where they could make a living without government support. The fact that he prevailed against the odds to become a Nobel laureate in economics is therefore a tribute to the, to the tenacity of the man and indeed of the Caribbean persona. As our very first vice chancellor, I believe Sir Arthur Lewis would approve of the current UE mission that drives its 2017 to 2022 strategic plan, which says that it seeks to advance learning, to create knowledge and foster innovation for the positive transformation of the Caribbean and the wider world. Given his personal experience and his life's efforts, he would be proud of the three pillars that underpin this strategic plan. The first is access, which treats with widening access to quality tertiary education. And alignment, which speaks to greater alignment of our single university with academia, industry, and international partnerships relevant to the region's needs. And agility in using UE's uh, resources and capabilities to respond to the needs of its key stakeholders in a changing environment. So Arthur's broad practical experiences at the United Nations in Africa and as the first director of the Caribbean Development Bank had in his own words, and I quote, broadened his understanding of developmental problems beyond the, realms, the realm of academia. We too have come a long way at the University of the West Indies, moving from a college in Jamaica with 33 students to a full-fledged regional university with more than 40,000 students in just 70 years. That's our enrollment to date. In 2018, the University of the West Indies is the largest, most long-standing higher education provider in the Commonwealth Caribbean, with three physical campuses and the open campus that serves the wider Caribbean. It is significant that when the Federation of the Caribbean fell apart in the 1950s, the UWI was one of the few institutions to survive the resulting cleavages. Never doubt, therefore, that through good times and bad, the UE will always do 
its part to prepare and to motivate succeeding generations to achieve that ultimate goal, sustainable development throughout our region. So while we celebrate UE's unique legacy, contributions and, and its role in the national, regional, international uh, arena, we understand that this work remains ongoing and there is yet a long road to travel. So I'd like to thank Dr. Ghani. I can't see him over the monitor, yes. And the Salises team for organizing this important symposium and I wish you all a very productive and enlightening day. Thank you and have a good morning. Thank you very much, Principal, for your kind remarks and your words of welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, we move right along now into the first panel of the day, and I invite Dr. Car Darren Conrad, uh, lecturer in economics and deputy dean for distance education and outreach in the Faculty of Social Sciences, uh, to take command of this part of the proceedings. And panelists, if you can come forward. Good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to welcome you to the first panel of uh, the Sir Arthur Lewis Memorial Symposium this morning. And uh, the title of this panel this section would be uh, Sir uh, no, Arthur Lewis, More Than an Economist, Good econo Economists Need More Economics. Uh, the presenters we have would be in the order of Dr. Godfrey St. Bernard, followed by Dr. Talia Esnard, then Dr. Hamid Ghani and Dr. Priya Mohan. Dr. Godfrey St. Bernard, a senior fellow at Salesis UE St. Augustine, uh, has been uh, obtained his uh, PhD in social demography from the University of Western Ontario, London in 1993. He is the coordinator of the Master of Science in Development Statistics offered at Salesis, uh, no stranger to us here at St. Augustine and has authored numerous and co-authored numerous books, journals, book chapters, and technical papers that traverse the social sciences, mainly in the fields of demography and sociology. I would do the abridged version of the biographies in the essence of time. I'd be here all morning. Uh, that's the extent to which the panel is extremely qualified. Follow, and Dr. Godfrey St. Bernard would be presenting on Caribbean demographics, social policy, and social justice, the relevance of insights from Sir Arthur Lewis. I'll introduce all of the panelists and then we'll get right into the presentations, followed by Dr. Talia Esnard, who will be presenting on my conversations with Sir Arthur Lewis. We look forward to hearing about that. As a St. Lucian, a lecturer, and a sociologist, Dr. Esnard is a sociologist in the Department of Behavioral Sciences here at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine's campus, and her research focuses on issues affecting Caribbean women who work with educational within the educational and entrepreneurial spheres. She too has published in a number of journals uh, with regards to this issue and is a recipient of the Taiwan Research Fellowship and CARICOM Canada Leadership Program. Uh, Dr. Hamid Ghani, Director of Salesis St. Augustine. Uh, no, uh, no extended introduction there we have for Dr. Ghani. He's the Director of Salesis also a senior lecturer in the Department of Political Science here at St. Augustine University of the West Indies, and he will be presenting on the title, I hope I get this one right, The Consociationalists and Federalists. 
And then we have followed by Dr. Priya Mohan, who is a postdoctoral research fellow at Salesis here at St. Augustine as well. Uh, Dr. Mohan is a postdoctoral fellow and uh, her research focuses on a wide range of topics around Caribbean growth and development, including, but not limited to, diversification, natural disasters, extractive industries, Caribbean economic history, firm competitiveness, value chains, and clusters. And we'll be presenting a, uh, the, a pioneer for Caribbean economic diversification and development. That is Arthur Lewis, a pioneer for Caribbean economic diversification and development. So certainly, uh, well, a uh, qualified panel to present on various dimensions. And I would like to just remind the panelists that each of us would have a 20 minutes to present. I will give you a two minute and a one minute uh, warning. Uh, when the time is up, I will let you know. And we asked if you can observe the 20 uh, minute um, uh, presentation time frame in order to facilitate questions that we may have from the audience. So I do thank you in advance for that. So please join me in welcoming the first panelist to the podium. Uh, Dr. Godfrey St. Bernard. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and um, thanks to the chair for his introduction. First of all, I want to exp express my pleasure in being a panelist in this symposium that is honoring the life and work of Sir Arthur Lewis, who is the person after which Salises has been named. And given his multidisciplinary perspectives in his scholarship, I would like to bring the perspective of social demography to bear upon his thoughts. And that is going to be the trust of the paper as I go through it. So the main aims of the paper is to trace the historical connection between economic motives, social condition, and population dynamics, to highlight the scholarly contributions of Sir Arthur Lewis, in particular those that have addressed economic development, unemployment, poverty, and population dynamics, to offer some insights for national development planning by placing emphasis on socio-demographic variables as the critical targets for gauging development policy trust, bearing in mind insights advocated by Sir Arthur Lewis, and to comment on social condition to treat more specifically with social justice and prospective trajectories for development policy discourse in accordance with interdisciplinary insights of Sir Arthur Lewis. So I begin the presentation by looking at economics as a science that treats with the allocation of goods and services, which are essentially and will always be scarce resources. And the mission of humankind is always to facilitate their well-being as individuals, as social groups, as communities, and in great, at, at higher levels of collectivities at the national level. Economics as a discipline is divided into three parts, descriptive economics, economic theory, and applied economics. And I speak to this because I'm basically looking at the fact that um, a lot of the work of Sir Arthur Lewis falls within the realm of applied economics. In particular, he wrote about developments that I think if we have to think about them, we have to think in terms of European societies and the Industrial Revolution and the impact of the Industrial Revolution 
the Industrial Revolution as a process that really facilitated that transition from feudal societies into capitalist societies. And essentially, in European societies, the growth of capitalism, so to speak, has its roots in the Industrial Revolution. I think we can also, in responding to Lewis, think a bit about some of the work of Marx and Maltus. Maltus from a population dynamic standpoint, Marx from an economic standpoint. Marx's work has been primarily one rooted in economic determinism and more or less looking as did Maltus at you know, social condition as a function of economic relations. Moreover, there is a reciprocal relationship between these two phenomena, social condition and economic relations. And as I progress in the paper, I will deal more with it. But at the time when these individuals were writing, it was primarily one of economic um, factors impacting social condition, and a lot of their work really responded to that sort of thing. So both Maltus and Marx emphasized links between economic factors, social condition, and inherently both of them spoke to links with population dynamics because in essence what Maltus was saying is that you know, population is projected to grow so fast that if we don't emphasize certain checks and balances, it would have a deleterious effect on humankind leading to poverty and starvation and so on, and that we had to check population growth if we had to preserve the well-being and the social condition of humankind. Marx, on the other hand, was saying, hey, population growth is not a problem. Population growth is beneficial to the well-being of humankind. And the reason why that is not the case is because you have two classes in opposition with one another, a capitalist class and a working class, and the capitalist class keeps exploiting the working class and keeping them at a relatively low level. So uh, there, there, there were these kinds of tendencies already existing. But I think a point I want to make and a point I want to address is that point related to this whole concept of the demographic transition and the theory of demographic transition, which if you are not a demographer or have not been introduced to it in an introductory sociology course, it, it would miss you altogether. And I think it is a critical theory more or less explaining global population dynamics starting, and in the case of Europe, prior to the Industrial Revolution, where countries had high fertility rates and high mortality rates, and subsequent to the Industrial Revolution, you had declining mortality followed by declining fertility, and then a third stage of the transition where both fertility and mortality were at relatively low levels. This is a theory because it doesn't matter which country, and the evidence by now has shown that almost every country globally will go through this transition, albeit at different stages and manifested in, at, in terms of different levels for fertility and mortality. But I'm talking to this because I think in the work of Sir Arthur Lewis, he was actually responding to it, perhaps without even making reference to it. And nothing is wrong with that. But I think it is critical of you know, his multidisciplinary foci. So to move on, if I were to say a few things about Sir Arthur Lewis, which I think many people in the room would say, of course, he was born and lived as a youth in St. Lucia, and you see the dates there. His life was one of being an academician, um, a student at London School of Economics in the, in the 1930s, and joining the staff there in 1940. Um, he was appointed um, as the Chair of Political Economy at the University of Manchester in 1948, and he served this university as its principal between 1958 and 1962 and Vice-Chancellor between 1962 and 1963. Subsequent to 1963, he spent the rest of his life as Chair of Political Economy at the universe, Princeton University and died in 1991. 
Of course, his intellectual, the intellectual and experiential currents that impacted his work really um, were those of the likes of Adam Smith, Karl Marx, Thomas Maltus, to mention a few, and many of the neoclassical thinkers, including Alfred Marshall and John Maynard Keynes, for those who have been in economics. Of course, they, he had a widespread knowledge of the social and economic history of England between the two world wars, and he worked not only in developed countries, but in many developing regions of the world, particularly Asia, Africa, and the Caribbean. So what are some of the key tenets, so to speak, of the scholarship of Lewis? Well, first, his contribution to policy, and we can see that as twofold, because according to Kirkpatrick and Barrientos, 2004, his contribution, as I noted earlier, was certainly in the realm of policy science and really addressing um, the means to transform, you know, underdeveloped and developing societies from being in a state of economic underdevelopment and low living standards to a better state station in life for their respective peoples. It also, from a policy perspective, introduced a multidisciplinary character for drawing those interactions and interconnections between social and economic factors. Um, let me see, I think I need to go back. I need to go back to a previous slide. I went ahead of myself. Um, Yes, okay. Yes, in terms of plantation slavery, indentureship, he made reference to those experiences in Caribbean societies. And he made reference to the fact that they were primarily responsible for a subsistence culture and a subsistence sector, which was primarily based on the agricultural activity in the main. And he was basically arguing that that was not good enough to facilitate the economic growth and the economic development that the Caribbean needed. What he advocated was the need for foreign investment, introducing multinationals, and building an emergent capitalist class. In other words, what he was arguing is just as in the case of the um, European societies at the time of the Industrial Revolution, when things took off, that this was basically what was needed in Caribbean societies to get them off the ground. But given how they were structured, it was not that simple for the masses to contribute to that capitalist class, so there was eventually uh, a process that led to multinationals coming into the system. So in essence, what he was advocating and what really persisted was a labor market dualism. So the capitalist class was really seen as the engine for economic development from the standpoint of the work of Sartre Lewis. And once economic development is triggered, of course, that would lead to further, further to this improvements in social condition, social well-being, and, and, and enhance the livelihoods of individuals as individuals, as within their respective social groups and in their communities and so on. So, He was cognizant, and I have to add, in terms of the 
looking now at the demographic transition theory, what one would think is that, you know, at the time he was conditioned of, con cognizant of the fact that Caribbean populations and populations in other parts of the developing world were growing rapidly. And they were growing rapidly because these were countries at that point in time, particularly in the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s, fertility rates were still high, but mortality rates had begun to decline. And one of the things about mortality rate declining is that you're going to have more people surviving in the population. And that in and of itself is an engine that would contribute to population growth, not to mention the fact that more women would live to become adults and contribute to fertility and so on. So all the factors consistent with population growth, rapid population growth, were evident during the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s in Caribbean societies, and were more or less consistent with that second stage of the demographic transition, if you understand what was happening. So what I am really looking at now is Lewis perhaps did not live to perhaps begin to experience some of the manifestations of the third stage of the demographic transition in Caribbean societies. That third stage where many Caribbean societies now have low fertility levels, in many instances below replacement, and mortality is relatively low in some societies, relatively low compared to what they were in the past. And we are talking about events that would have occurred since the 1980s and intensified into the 1990s and the 2000s. So what is this, what, what, what is happening as far as the advanced stage of demographic transition in Caribbean societies? We are now at a point where many countries in the Caribbean have population growth rates that are currently below 1% per annum. That is really low. Countries' populations are plateauing. Actually, population sizes are likely to decline between 2020 and 2050 in several Caribbean societies. Many people don't know that. But sometime by 2020 and certainly before 2050, many countries are going to experience population decline. Of course, many more people are aware of the fact that increasingly larger proportions of populations will be persons um, 65 years or older. I often tell people when I was a young person, I used to visit homes in Ariapita Avenue and go to parties in people's living rooms and sit and chat with my friends in their living rooms. Those living rooms are now dance halls and restaurants and, and so on, and I would I would um, hazard a guess that in the 2020s to 2050s, those dance halls and restaurants may become geriatric homes. So we have to be um, aware of these dynamics. Of course, there is a potential shrinkage of the workforce unless you know, labor is attracted from overseas, including capital. And we have to be, you know, cognizant of these kinds of threats, right? However, according to the unlimited supplies of labor, wages in both the sectors, and I'm talking about the capitalist sector and the subsistence sector, were assumed to increase in cases where, you know, you had fairly modest gains in economic growth. Many countries have inordinately large youth unemployment still, and in some areas, gross underemployment of young people. I mentioned declining fertility, and because while there's declining fertility, we have to know that in some subclasses, in particular the marginal classes, the, the, the lower realms of our society, fertility is not declining. Fertility is still relatively high and above replacement level. With declining fertility, you're going to have declining numbers of persons um, being born, but relatively greater proportions of them will be born in classes 
characterized by those who are largely operating at the subsistence level. We have to think quantitatively and qualitatively about what that means for our human capital accumulation and by extension, you know, that prospect of entering and continuing that extension of the capitalist class and pursuing capitalist ventures. Of course, with all of this and the declining population size, there are prospects for immigrants entering the region and from more populous regions of the world to augment the labor supply that would eventually be under threat. China, India, regions of the Middle East, Latin America, these are the regions where this labor will come from. To a lesser extent, you know, European populations in smaller numbers. But these are populations that will be entering um, with higher human capital attributes than Caribbean natives and entering also with a propensity toward investment. So this has serious policy implications in terms of how do we treat with, first of all, promoting greater openness with respect to employment practices to ensure that there's balance and, 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 and equity in terms of who gets the jobs and that sort of thing. We have to protect um, Caribbean natives. Um, reinforcement of you know, imminent um, language proficiency um, among emergent Caribbean populations. So we have to become multilingual and initiatives have to be institutionalized to build and support entrepreneurial um, capabilities among them. Just to say a few quick things about um, the social policy and an imperative for social justice, um, social policy interventions are imperative, and this is really responding to the demographic currents and so on that um, intertwined with some of the thoughts of Sarata. Um, in particular, the attainment of social justice goes a long way in providing assurances of improved well-being. To talk about social justice is really about you know, removing all those um, barriers through legislative and regulatory um, decrees that you know, otherwise, if not implemented, would see the um, injustices prevailing. But to talk about social policy and to talk about social well-being, it is not only about you know, enhancing the material and the spiritual well-being of individuals. It is also about treating with issues of equality and equity. And interestingly, I say all of this because at the point in time when, um, when um, these issues Worries. Of course, in today's world, when we talk about um, material well-being and, 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 and yeah, I'm wrapping up. When we talk about material well-being and individual well-being, we have all these social, um, those all these surveys of living conditions, which tells us something about you know the poverty state of households and individuals. We have measures that account for expenditure patterns in households and so on. But it's not only about that. It's about you know, equality. And if we are talking about equality, difference, of course, individuals have ascriptive characteristics that make them different. I am born in Trinidad and Tobago. Somebody else is born in Guyana. We are different on the basis of our place of birth. But is there variability in terms of you know, those achieved characteristics? And to the extent that there is substantial variability, we are talking about inequality. In terms of equity, we are talking about distribution. And we have measures that would permit us now to undertake and to gauge these things, such as the Gini coefficient, among others. What I am saying is back in the day when Sir Arthur was writing, many of these indicators were not available to people like us in the region. Today they are, and even today, we do not have sufficient data to really permit the kind of exercises that we need to undertake. By and large, to talk about you know, capital accumulation, I must make this statement that in terms of you know, the, the work advocated by Sir Arthur, it was really a case of 
could we obtain financial capital to develop the physical capital to take advantage of the natural capital that exists in the region and the human capital, but we have to build the human capital. And insofar as we build the human capital, what about the um, social um, capital and how we begin to investigate it? So what I'm basically saying is, had he been alive, I think you know these are the kinds of issues that would have engaged his attention by way of revision. So to close off, I would like to say it is always a daunting task to reflect upon the thought process of a gifted intellectual, a distinguished scholar, right, such as Sir Arthur Lewis. Nonetheless, I could not help draw on the convergence between his economic theorizing, demographic theory, and their collective implications for social policy. So I thank you for your attention. Yes, dear. Okay, as with everything else, with all the well intentions and good plans, we always would have some minor technical glitch, so we'll have to come back to the presentation by Dr. S. So for right now, until we retrieve that presentation, we apologize for that. We will retrieve that presentation and then go back. But in the interim, we will then divert to, defer to Dr. Ghani for his presentation at this point. Dr. Ghani, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And um, <clears throat> my presentation is on W. Arthur Lewis, the Consociationalist and Federalist. So I want to talk a little bit about consociationalism. And uh, Aaron Leipard proposed consociational democracy at the IPSA Congress in Brussels in 1967, the International Political Science Association. Um, Congress in Brussels in 1967. Aaron Leipart is a renowned political scientist. And consociational democracy challenges the link between democratic stability on the one hand and social structure on the other hand. 
Uh, in many respects, this was challenging some of the prevailing views at the time in the mid to late 60s uh, that suggested that uh, these new states that were emerging that had um, these diverse societies were likely to be prone to some measure of democratic instability by virtue of their social composition. So that consociational democracy refers to societies with high social fragmentation and governmental stability, so that you could in fact have governmental stability, uh, democratic stability and governmental stability despite having high social fragmentation. So that uh, Leipzig suggested that uh, sources of accommodative behavior among political elites was one of the ways in which this would happen so that political elites would in fact be the ones who could ensure that you keep the peace uh, by virtue of accommodative behavior among them. Uh, the ability and willingness of political elites to forge compromises was a key component uh, of uh, consociationalism. Uh, compromises ac had to be acceptable to the respective subcultures. So when leaders went back to their respective subcultures, of course, they needed to have some measure of buy-in. Uh, consociational politics uh, was deemed to be flexible, transferable, and exportable. So basically what Leipzig was arguing is that this could work anywhere in the world, you could carry it anywhere, lift it up and take it anywhere, and it would work. Tribal, religious, or other conflict could be diffused uh, by consociational politics. Okay. Right. So what is consociationalism? Um, according to Leipzig, in his book, Thinking About Democracy, published by Routledge in 2008, uh, we get what might be the essence of um, a definition. Consociational democracy means government by elite cartel designed to turn a democracy with a fragmented political culture into a stable democracy. Uh, efforts at consociationalism are not necessarily successful, of course. Um, consociational designs failed in Cyprus and Nigeria, and Uruguay abandoned its Swiss-style consociational system. Successful consociational democracy requires, one, that elites have the ability to accommodate the divergent interests and demands of the subcultures, which is a key component. This requires that they have the ability to transcend cleavages and to join in a common effort with the elites of rival subcultures, so there has to be some measure of uh, accommodative behavior. Uh, this, in turn, depends on their commitment to the maintenance of the system. They have to be committed that they want to keep the system going and to the improvement of its cohesion and stability. Finally, all of the above requirements are based on the assumption that the elites understand the perils of political fragmentation. So that an understanding of the perils of political fragmentation is obviously another one of those uh, conditionalities that, that must apply among the leaders. So these four requirements are logically implied by the concept of consociational democracy. That is about as concise a definition as I can give you uh, from Leipzig's thinking, and it comes from his 2008 book, um, Thinking About Democracy. So how did Leipzig recognize Lewis? Because Lewis was clearly recognized by Leipzig, and um, writing in his famous work, Patterns of Democracy, published by Yale University Press in 1999, Aaron um, Leipzig said, and I quote, as the Nobel Prize winning economist Sir Arthur Lewis and he makes reference to that 1965 work that I'll talk about, pages 64 to 65, has forcefully pointed out majority rule and the government versus opposition pattern of politics that it implies may be interpreted as undemocratic because they are principles of exclusion. So he references some passages from Lewis's uh, work, Politics in West Africa, uh, about all who are affected by a decision should have the chance to participate in making that decision either directly or through chosen representatives. That's Lewis's words. And Leipzig then said that if this means that winning parties may make all the governmental decisions and that the losers may criticize but not govern, Lewis argues the two meanings are incompatible. So Leipzig is referencing that on page 31 of his Patterns of Democracy. And then he continues, although the joint power and divided power aspects of consensus democracy are conceptually and empirically distinct dimensions. They represent complementary institutional mechanisms for the accommodation of deep societal divisions. This finding strengthens Sir Arthur Lewis's recommendation that both dimensions of consensus democracy in particular, Lewis advocates power sharing cabinets, federalism, these are needed in plural societies. So Lewis makes a strong case for power sharing cabinets and for federalism in plural societies. 
So some passages from uh, Lewis's Politics in West Africa that he published in 1965, <coughs> which were based on some lectures that he gave at McMaster University, the Widden Lecture Series at McMaster University. Uh, and this was published by George Allen and Unwin, um, London, 1965. So one of the quotes from pages 64 to 65 that Leipart referenced earlier, all who are affected by a decision should have the chance to participate in making that decision, either directly or through chosen representatives and then to exclude losing groups from participation in decision-making clearly violates the primary meaning of democracy. These are Lewis's words. So let's just summarize a little bit of uh, Leipard's views on Lewis in his Thinking About Democracy 2008 publication. So the example of consociational democracy as a rationally invented model can be found in Lewis's Politics in West Africa. He observed and deplored the breakdown of democracy that was occurring in West African countries in the 1960s. His diagnosis of this failure was that the West African ethnically divided countries had not adopted the right kind of democracy at independence. So he says that what they adopted at independence was not the right kind of democracy for Africa. Uh, what they needed was broad inter-ethnic coalitions, and that was one of the prescriptions, elections by PR, proportional representation, and ethnic group autonomy. These were key ingredients that Lewis felt were needed in plural societies and were needed in what he saw happening in West Africa. He did not attach a comprehensive label to these proposals, but they add up to consociational democracy. That is Leipart speaking. Uh, nevertheless, Leipart claims to have discovered uh, consociationalism, but asserts, and this is important, that Lewis invented it. So Leipart's actual tribute to Lewis in words Another striking example of consociational democracy as a rationally invented model can be found in Sir Arthur Lewis's 1965 Politics in West Africa. Lewis was an economist born in St. Lucia in the Caribbean and of African descent. He served as an economic advisor to several of the governments of West Africa from 1953 to 1965, and he observed and deplored the breakdown of democracy that was occurring in these countries. His diagnosis of this failure was that the West African ethnically divided countries had not adopted the right kind of democracy upon independence. What they needed, he argued, was broad inter-ethnic coalitions, elections by PR, proportional representation, and ethnic group autonomy. He did not attach a comprehensive label to these proposals, but they clearly add up to consociational democracy. He did not mention any empirical examples of consociationalism either, and he appears not to have known of the Colombian, Lebanese, Dutch, and other precedents. Hence, in contrast to political scientists like uh, Gerhard Lembrook and myself, who discovered consociationalism a few years later, Lewis invented it by trying to think what would be the logical solution to the problems in West Africa. This is another example of consociationalism as a creative invention and rational choice, especially significant because, as I already mentioned in the introduction, Lewis was the first modern scholar to identify the consociational model of democracy. Aaron Leipart, pages 278 to 279 of Thinking About Democracy. So Lewis, the consociationalist, the concept of majority rule and the concept of government versus opposition politics were not embraced by Lewis because they represented principles of exclusion. He felt that those who were the losers were excluded from the process. He did not like that model. The principle of rotation, that is, you're in power today, someone else is in power tomorrow, someone else comes back to power after that, which is the foundation of the majoritarian model of democracy, <clears throat> was challenged by Lewis on the ground that it excluded social minorities and placed them in permanent opposition in plural societies. Lewis preferred a more consensual approach to politics that involved proportional representation, power-sharing cabinets, and federalism. Leipart's presentation to the IPSA Congress in Brussels in 1967 on consociationalism had already been substantially discussed by Lewis in 1965 in politics in West Africa. So Leipart was not aware of Lewis's work in 65, and Lewis, uh, Leipart says, was not aware of the other models around him at the time. So that is why he credits Lewis as an inventor of consociationalism. 
So we come now to the West Indian Federation, of which we have heard a lot. It came into being in 1958, actually came into being in 1958. It been, had been discussed for a long time before. And <clears throat> one of the key elements of this, of course, is that there was tension in Jamaica uh, prior to the famous Lancaster House Conference of 1961. And the government of Jamaica had given an undertaking on the 31st of May 1960 that they would have a referendum on the issue of whether or not Jamaica should be in the Federation. That referendum was held on the 19th of September 1961. And the specific question put the to the electorate was, should Jamaica remain in the Federation of the West Indies? That is what was on the ballot. That was on the ballot paper. You either voted yes or you voted no. There were 217,319 votes that said, yes, Jamaica should remain, and 256,261 that said, no, Jamaica should leave. The turnout was 61.51%. The result confirmed jam exit from the Federation. So Jamaica was gone as far as the Federation was concerned, and everything had to be put in place now to uh, make arrangements for Jamaica's departure. So what were the challenges? Well, in 1965, Eric Williams spoke about this, and that speech is recorded in Paul Sutton's Forge from the Love of Liberty, uh, published by Longman Caribbean in 1981, uh, pages 297 to 98. These are the exact words of Eric Williams. The Jamaica referendum of September 1961 spelled the doom of the Federation of the West Indies. This was immediately obvious to all of us in the PNM government. The smaller islands and the United Kingdom did not take this view of the matter and began to put pressure on us to accept a substitute federation of nine countries, as Prime Minister Macmillan had urged on me when he visited Trinidad. From the West Indian point of view, Arthur Lewis prepared a memorandum at the request of Grantley Adams, suggesting how the smaller federation might be organized and might operate. In summary, it involved a federal budget of $60.8 million, of which Trinidad and Tobago was to contribute $45.34 million, or just under 75%. But Arthur Lewis added that, quote, it is arguable that Trinidad should contribute 80%. So clearly, Williams and Lewis were not on the same page. Williams went on. Where representation in the federal parliament was concerned, however, Arthur Lewis argued in what he claimed was, quote, the general consensus unquote, in the other territories that the formula arrived at in the intergovernmental conferences should be maintained, committed himself to a Trinidad and Tobago representation, which was not based on the fact that Trinidad and Tobago accounted for approximately 60% of the population of the nine territory federation. To put it bluntly, Trinidad and Tobago was to pay three quarters of the budget, but to have less than half of the seats in the federal parliament. This was wholly unacceptable to the PNM cabinet. That is a direct quote from Eric Williams' 1965 speech that is reproduced in Sutton's Forge from the Love of Liberty. So, what went on between Arthur Lewis and Eric Williams? Uh, in secret uh, and personal notes that have been declassified in the UK National Archives, CO 1031-3278, by note by Dr. A. Lewis, dated the 9th of November, 1961, the following is recorded. And these are Lewis's personal and private notes about his meetings with Eric Williams in 1961. He quotes, I saw Dr. Williams four times, September 22nd, according to Lewis. And these are Lewis's words. I went to see him to persuade him to declare in favor of a strong Eastern Caribbean Federation. He was full of venom and insisted that he wanted the whole Federation to mash up. Only then would he consider starting a new Federation on Trinidad's terms. I then switched to persuading him not to say anything at all, and he said he would propose to his party that he keep Federation out of the election. There was an election due on the 4th of December, 1961. Trinidad's terms would be strong Federation on the lines of the economics of nationhood. He welcomed the proposal that I sound out the other governments. He repudiated any immediate intention of declaring for the independence of Trinidad. October 6th. I reported that Mr. Bird of Antigua was willing to accept the main features of a strong federation, provided no attempt was made at a unitary state. He was pleased with my report that a reasonable settlement could be made. He informed me that Ellis Clark had advised that the federation would end in March, and I tried vainly to argue him out of this. He thought he might be ready for a meeting in January. He undertook to read and comment on my report. November 3rd. We had lunch in his house for two hours. He had previously read a first draft of my report addressed to him. There was a marked shift in his thinking towards a unitary state, 
but his mind still seemed to be open on this subject. The alarming shift was in his attitude to a conference. He could not have his party convention till mid-January. This would have to be followed by educating the public. Clearly, he was thinking in terms of months. By now, he had also publicly committed himself to the ending of the Federation in March. I gained the impression that destroying the Federation had become an obsession and that his desire to bring off this coup was his main reason for elaborating a program of public education which would pre prevent him reaching the conference table until after March. He would circulate my report to his friends and officials and invited me to return for further comment after my visit to BG, British Guyana. November 8th. He had not yet received comments on my report. His mind was still toying with a unitary state, and he seemed a little less open. But he argued in a friendly way. His attitude to a conference was much worse. He now objected even to the presence of the federal government at, the conference, at a conference. Though when pressed, he gave the impression that he might yield on this. It was clear that he would not come to a conference summoned by the federal government, which in any case would not exist for him after March. Asked where we go from here, was he prepared to summon his own unofficial parley of chief ministers? He replied that the colonial office had got us into this mess and had a duty to take the initiative in getting us out. There ought soon to be discussion on practical arrangements for continuing common services when the Federation came to an end. Continuing November 8th, he had received a nice letter from Mr. Maudling. Reginald Maudling was Secretary of State for the Colonies. He had received a nice letter from Mr. Maudling. He would attend a conference if it was clear that the federal government would not keep interfering in the discussion. He insisted that he was anxious to come to terms with many other islands and we spent some time on steps he might take to make friends. I pointed out that he was creating an image of himself as the big bad wolf waiting to devour the little islands. He promised to mend his ways. The end result of the Lewis Williams negotiations, a resolution passed by the PNM General Council on the 14th of January, 1962. Be it therefore resolved that Trinidad and Tobago reject unequivocally any participation in the proposed federation of the Eastern Caribbean and proceed forthwith to national independence without prejudice to the future association in a unitary state of the people of Trinidad and Tobago with any territory of the Eastern Caribbean whose people may so desire and on terms to be mutually agreed, but in any case providing for the maximum possible degree of local government. And be it further resolved that the PNM's government in Trinidad and Tobago take the initiative in proposing the maximum possible measure of collaboration among the units of the disintegrated federation in respect of such common services as the university, that would be us, and communications. And be it further resolved that Trinidad and Tobago declare their willingness to associate with all people of the Caribbean in a Caribbean economic community, that would be CARICOM, that was to come in the future, and to take such action as may be necessary for the achievement of this objective. This was the end result of the Lewis Williams negotiations. On the 4th of December, 1961, the PNM had won the general election and had uh, stayed in power, formed the government. This is January of 62. Reginald Maudling, the Secretary of State for the Colonies, arrived in Trinidad on the 15th of January, 1952, and was greeted with this. Lewis, the Federalist, had his uh, ups and downs with Eric Williams in this negotiation to try to save the Federation of the West Indies. They clearly had two different views of the world and this was the end result. So I hope that I've shared with you some interesting uh, views on Lewis the Consociationalist. So you get a sense of his personal philosophy about political democracy and Lewis the Federalist based on his own practical experiences in trying to save the Federation of the West Indies. Thank you.
Good morning to all. <clears throat> so Arthur Lewis's work touches on many issues related to that of Caribbean development, democracy, poverty, and education, just to name a few. Over the years, his writings on various issues have engaged my thoughts, my teachings, and in more recent times, my research agenda. In fact, on many occasions, the engagement has led to many conversations between Sir Arthur Lewis and myself, henceforth called Sal. These conversations were quite diverse and range from the land of our birth to development economics, Caribbean development, poverty, education, and identity. Today I stand before you to share my many conversations with Sal. The paper is crafted as part of a dialogic exchange between Sal and myself and takes the form of a dual ethnography. It emerges as a methodology that explores the intersection of self and other. Self here, other Sir Arthur Lewis, Sal. While it is fundamentally autobiographical in nature, I use it to contextualize our connection, to provide meaning to his work, to provide meaning to our connection and how his work has influenced my life, my work, and my teachings. As a Saint Lucian, I'm making sure I have this properly. As a Saint Lucian, I have connected with Sal on issues of education and identity. We have spoken on this. My gaze into the life and work of Sal started as a child growing up in the city of Castries, St. Lucia. My gaze started by my early, sorry, my gaze into the life and work of Sal started as a child growing up in the city of Castries, St. Lucia, being told by my early educators at the Canon Laurie Anglican Primary School, Heron and Closed, of a great and noble student of our school and on a son of the soil who won the global prize in economics. Back then, I knew nothing of what that meant, of what he had written, and the impact that his work would possibly have. What I knew then was that he attended the same primary school that I was at the time. He was also a St. Lucian, whose achievements spanned across and beyond the shores of our nation, but who, by his work, made our country proud. For me, that story, that narrative, that achievement, and that mark of distinction has nurtured not just a sense of national pride, but also an inspiration for excellence. It was that inspiration that secured a gradual shift from my initial gaze into his work to my many conversations with Sal. The conversation started at the tender age of 16, when I entered the gates of the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. And at that college, I remember distinctly seeing this very same motto on entering the gates, it says, in pursuit of excellence. That meant a lot to me somehow. It signaled a new phase in my life, a reminder of Lewis's work, of what he had said to me in the past, and a call to action. It signaled also a time to reflect on what I needed to do going forward. I remember that I asked this of Sal, and I remembered getting no response. And I wondered why. But I waited, and after several months, I asked it again, and I remember the day that he retorted. It was the day that I entered the Hunter J. Fasua Library at the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College, and I saw a short biography of his work. I became not just intellectually curious, but also very clear at the time that Sal had already provided the answers to my many questions, not just only in his biography, but in his writings and I looked to them both. It was that examination and early leanings into his work that I became connected to Sal on a deeper level, in fact, on a spiritual one. I often visited the gravesite in which he was very well planted near the college. I remember the early mornings, the early morning visits when the college was extremely serene, with the fresh mountainous breeze passing between us and our usual conversations and mere minutes before the start of that dreaded 8 a.m. history class. I did not dread the history, I dreaded the time. I recall the weight of my size. 
And I could harken back particularly to that burial, that first burial site conversation when I returned to the question of intellectual pursuits. As I watched the words on his tombstone, not very clearly shown in this picture, I remembered the, that he said the following to me, please revisit my biography. There's much to be told in there. Sal said the following also to me. I grew up at the time when the British government, as our principal said earlier, imposed a ban on people of color. He wanted to be a lawyer. He did not want to be a lawyer, my apologies, nor a doctor, but he wanted to become an engineer, as he earlier mentioned. My response to Sal, unlike you, I wanted to become a lawyer, not because of just its self-sustaining nature, but because in this particular case, of the social standing and the prestige that the legal profession had in St. Lucia at the time. However, I also knew that there was some measure of social closure in that profession. It was the colorism and the classism that pervaded our society. It was its ascriptive characteristics that was sustained by the legacies of colonialism, slavery, and Eurocentricism. To a large extent, Sal, such stratification criteria has left many behind while ensuring the progress of a few. And Sal responds in the following. That is why, to a large extent, I decided to study business administration. Planning to return to St. Lucia for a job in the public sector or in private trade, so I went to the School of London, or London School of Economics, to do the Bachelor's in Commerce, which offered accounting, business management, commercial law, and a little bit of statistics. I responded in the same. I am thinking about something in business studies, Sal. What do you think? But for some reason, I don't want to do business because it's lucrative. I don't think it is lucrative at the time. But because of my own reflections of a mother who was quite ambitious and who survived as a self-employed woman and as a single parent. And it is because of that reality that I decided to work for a year in your alma mater, Sal, at St. Mary's College. Steady on, my friend, he said. I also worked as a clerk. And after completing my school at the age of 15, while waiting, I decided to do this as an interim measure. Do not be dismayed. Those very words for me were very encouraging. And for many levels, on many levels, it taught me the value of persistence, of strength, of centering one's goal despite the hurdles that are laid along the journey. So I worked for a year at the St. Mary's College with young boys who were the cream of the crop at the time. That experience taught me to be on top of one's game. However, during that year, my conversations with Sal somewhat decreased. I no longer had the pleasure of visiting his, his burial site, and I became locked into the everyday practice of a secondary school teacher. I wanted more. So I applied to UWE to do a Bachelor of Business Administration. And to my surprise and initial disappointment, the letter wrote, you have been accepted to read for a degree in sociology. I was initially disappointed, but I had no idea at the time what sociology meant, the scope of it, and how I would eventually fall for a discipline so rich analytically and so wide in its imaginations. I, my initial skepticism was shared with Sal, and this is what he told me. I had no idea in 1933 what economics was, but I did the subject well from the start, and I graduated in 1937 with first class honors, and LSE gave me a scholarship to do the PhD in industrial economics. That I did, steady on. And it was during that time that I met two critical figures during the program in sociology. The first is one of Sharon Trezell, a St. Lucian who lectured first year sociology programs offered through the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. She spoke highly of Sal and also of Karl Marx. Her attention and praise to Sal's work ingrained in me a deeper sense of his scholarly work and a yearning for more. That I got in the second year course called Social Change and Development with a particular intellectual and critical thinker called Dr. D.A.V. Brown. On a lighter note, I always remember Dr. Brown lecturing and processing his thought at the very same time. He always watched the exit and I wondered whether he wanted to leave the classroom or whether he was really thinking. 
but it appeared that he was thinking. On a more serious note, I was very much influenced by his intellectual curiosity, and in every sense, he developed a sense in me, an intellectual curiosity and an interest in Sal's work. As a lecturer, I now have the privilege of teaching that very same course in which I sat and which I became inspired to look at Sal's work even more. And I use the course to share with my students even more of Sal, his work, his accomplishments, and his troubles. In one particular conversation I had with Sal, I asked of this. I said, what was the impetus for development economics at the time? What gave you this idea to call on the foreign investors and make this part of your development thrust? And this is what he said to me. My main concern at the time was the social economic conditions in the region at the time. And I need for you to also look at the challenge facing post-colonial societies in the immediate 1930s period. It was marked by a period of civil unrest, of political, political agitation, and a subsequent appointment of the Moyne Commission, um, Moyne Commission by the British government in 1938. The main mandate of the commission he espoused was the need to investigate the conditions in the West Indies. Perhaps, he insisted, you should read the actual report. That I did. And I use those reports and the findings in the report in my lectures now to share with students the need to contextualize the developmental gender in the region in the immediate post-independence era. I share with them the findings with reference to high population growth rates, as my colleague just mentioned, low quality of public health, limited availability of social services, including access to education. And I share particularly Sal's finding in terms of the economic sustainability of the region at the time. He was concerned, and you need to understand, of the fact that economic activities in the West Indies were limited to mining, agro-processing, consumer goods, and just basically social services or local services. I use these social and economic references to draw attention to the importance of context and how context influenced the work of scholars at that particular point in time. So, I must interject at this point. You also need to remind your students that the global position of the Caribbean society at the time was very much in question. We need to understand that relative to other more advanced countries, we were particularly challenged by our inability to engage in that unfolding global space. My urgent task at the time was the need to inform policymakers of how to improve the living conditions of people in less developed countries. In so doing, I rejected the juristic dogma of positivistic research and opted for more applied economics. I looked at public policy formation and development planning in the region. And I was a chairman, or I served as the chairman of the West Indian Commission responsible for the Moyne Commission report. And I particularly was also apprehensive about the level of technology at that time and the inability of those who had the position to use technology in the agricultural sector. While I recognized the role of early industries in the development of the West Indian economy at the time, please tell your students that I was also convinced that economies were too much locked into agricultural, redistributive, and retail trade, and did not possess sorry, the technological might and the entrepreneurial spirit, passion, confidence to change their economies. For me then, tell them it was a problem of supply, not in just economic or physical or material resources, but as the supply in terms of entrepreneurs. I pose another question to Sal. Why not indigenous development as a sustainable option? And this is what he says. With the absence of needed capital, technology, and technical knowledge, Industrial development became the preferred way out of social and economic problems for the region. They needed a jump start. And the only way to jump start that was to go large scale. With investments in light manufacturing, particularly in garments, textiles, and leather, these were to be exported to the metropole markets. You must understand, at that point, there was a, there was a clear deficit in a local capitalist class. 
and there was definitely an issue of savings. At the time, there was an inherent need to look outward to woo investors with tax incentives. However, you need to tell your students too that I never intended for this reliance on foreign investments to be more than temporary. It was part of a needed but initial push for development, not a permanent state of economic affairs. Tell them, please, they had to learn the tricks of the trade. And if they did not learn the tricks of the trade, then we will be forever in a state of perpetual poverty. Okay, Sal, I get it. I get the relevance of context. I get the particular vulnerabilities of our economies, and I get the need to change our spirits. But tell me something. How do we move from policy planning to policy implementation? He says, certainly, my child. We need national planning, and more so, supportive policies to sustain such activities. I know that this has been done throughout the Caribbean, but I would admit to you, this was not as successful as I originally hoped for. In explaining this shortfall, I must direct your attention to my conjecture that the failure to fully industrialize was not just an economic or social one, it was really just also a political one. A political one marred by three macroisms of power, those being colonialism, imperialism, and Eurocentricism. In fact, I maintain that part of the inherent problem of state capitalism was the inability of regional governments to exercise political will, a reality that is rooted in their historical and sustained relationship with imperial powers. I will also contend that the development project failed because it lacked a fundamental understanding of internal drive towards industrial revolution, either in the form of eager entrepreneurs or development-oriented governments. Indeed, Sal, interesting. I note all your points. But tell me something. Doesn't that approach literally put in a tailspin the project of self-reliance and independence? I know too that Lloyd Best called you out on this one, and so to do my students. How do you respond? At the heart of it all, he says, was the fact that the Caribbean turned to industrial trade, to international trade, as the basis of technological development and not the reverse. It is a forgotten factor always in explanations of my work. The sustained dependence on foreign industry and foreign banking, insurance, trade, institutions, and the like is what has caused our virtual standstill to this day. I warned against that. My students have also called you out on the fact that you claimed in your work that our one comparative advantage was the unlimited supply of cheap labor. They feel insulted. What do you say of this? He retorts. When I first published my article on unlimited supply of labor in 1954, I was greeted equally with applause and with cries of outrage. In succeeding 25 years, other scholars have written five books and numerous articles arguing the merits of the thesis, assessing the contradictory data and applying it to solve other problems. The reality is the debate continues. Thank you for sharing that and I take your points. I had to draw on the tendencies for multinational companies to increasingly dictate the state of our affairs in the region. I use your scholarship on Caribbean development to highlight the contradictions of that relationship and also the implications for our Caribbean societies. I often use reference in class to engage students in a critical reflection of these development ideologies, political trajectories around these, and how, in a sense, this created a sense of false security for which have ensured the ability, of, the ability of Caribbean people to shape their own futures or to become significantly involved in the local business sector. In fact, I usually close my class talking about dependent development. As a sociologist, however, I have used the position, the said and the unsaid, about issues affecting women racial and ethnic groups, and the significance of this for Caribbean development. On this slide, you will see, for example, Lewis has spoken about key issues in terms of challenge of entrepreneurial development in the region, 
the lack of risk adverse behavior, looking at the role of education, particularly for his concern, the education of blacks, race and ethnicity and culture. My work has been inspired by Lewis's conversations. In fact, as a sociologist, I have asked many questions and I have noted that the entrepreneurial revolution has now reached our doorsteps. There is increasing reference to our academic context in new public sector management, the rise of business schools across the globe, new ideas about teaching entrepreneurship as well as calls for market penetration. That discourse has reached right here in the University of the West Indies. The challenge of the 21st century has become how to promote an entrepreneurially driven society and how then do we enter new markets to enhance the sustainability of the region. As a sociologist, I am particularly concerned with what Lloyd Best, George Beckford, and Clive Thomas call persistent poverty. Not in the lack of material assets or material well-being, but in the lack of um, our capacities to circumvent or to resist ongoing economic adversities. Whether culturally, structurally, or politically designed, there is a clear deficit in our ability to engage in risk-adverse situations or to use these ideas to be innovative in the, economy, in the economy. The GEM report also says that even where we have an entrepreneurial sector, that entrepreneurs here do more retailing than innovating. However, there is a clear mandate for us to be entrepreneurial. How do we go ahead in that agenda? The gap lies in the fact that we have little research to provide answers. And that absence of research, together with Lewis's influence and discussion on the entrepreneurial development process, has inspired my doctoral work and other work that I continue to do on women in the entrepreneurial sector. I have noted elsewhere, he says, that economics is not enough and you need to look beyond economics. He said people of different ethnic and racial backgrounds have to learn to live peacefully together. He says the, the problem in plural societies is one that is nested in racism, in ethnocentrism, and in classism. He says if you look forward to the Caribbean development, do not forget the social status and social structure of your time. My personal viewpoint, Lewis says, is that social structures of post-colonial societies could present a challenge to the development agenda. For some reason, they speak more of my economic contribution. But what about racial cleavages? And how racial cleavages sorry, could marginalize others in that space? We don't have those conversations. I need for you to also look at issues of racial and ethnic biases that are formalized and that are institutionalized of what have these become. My journeys to West Africa has taught me just much that race matters, ethnicity matters, class matters. You need to explore these. I would certainly agree, I told him. My own work on women, work, and organizations in the Caribbean have begun to tease out some of these, and it is an ongoing journey. Sal responds to me in the following. I do agree with your work and some of the, your emphasis on the structural and familial aspects, but I want you to ask some important questions. And this is what he leaves with me. He says, of what, of why, sorry, do strong, do the strong oppress the weak? Of whether economic equality in terms of income is necessary and sufficient to produce a sense of social justice? of what is the role of education in that process, and of how do we entertain or deal with issues of pluralistic societies. Let these questions guide your way forward, because these are areas that still remain untapped as it relates to my work. A work of caution, he says, let your local research not be the end in itself. He says to me, we make contributions in science by our wide comparisons. We need to look beyond our shores. And our sociology should not just come from the West Indies, but beyond and abroad. You need to master old sociology of physics first, and then move forward based on that comparison. I shall, and I will. I will take your advice 
and steady on in that journey. So, remember too, the messages of our noble comrade. So Derek Walcott, whose work and contributions to literary world is increasingly celebrated. Perhaps too, he might be someone that you could engage in future dialogues and writings. Ah, Sal, interesting. We are thinking along similar lines. Indeed, his early writings on pan-Caribbean consciousness and identity continue to intrigue me. I am particularly amused by his writings on a far cry from Africa and a schooner's flight. I am increasingly identified not just with his reference to his sea green eyes or his shabbiness and how that created a sense of ambiguity in terms of identity, but also for his concern when this island was paradise. I know today that that paradise is slowly becoming a tourist plantation with increasing dependence on air and sea tourism. I therefore share his cries for the land that I love, the land and the people that have inspired me, but also for the socio-political and academic landscape for which I now occupy and from which I now feed. While the struggle continues, however, our two noble gems continue to ground me in a critical space. Just like our twin pitons, as iconic mountains of St. Lucia, you two have become identifiable twin symbols and gems of our beautiful country. I want to say happy birthday to you both today. I also want to take the opportunity to thank and to congratulate those who celebrate your life, your work, and your impact. Let me also say, um, till then, Thank you for listening, for engaging me, for inspiring me, Sal. Thank you for holding my hand, and I will continue to engage you and others in your, con in, in, I would continue, sorry, to engage you and others of your work in the continued future. I thank you. Okay, good morning everyone. I'm not sure where to stand. <laughs> okay, so having come last after such a distinguished panel, I would repeat some of what was said, but perhaps from an economic perspective and also build on, somewhat, build on what was said. So my presentation, Arthur Lewis, a pioneer for Caribbean economic diversification and development. In looking at the life and work of Sir William Arthur Lewis, one could say that his greatest economic contribution to the Caribbean is that he was the first person to formulate a coherent strategy of economic diversification for the region. And since then, many present day national development plans and policies continue to, in since then, present day national development plans and policies continue to include numerous fiscal and trade incentives to promote diversification as a principal means of increasing growth and development in the region. During the time of Lewis's writing, as the Great Depression carried on, the British West Indian labor unrest took place. The unrest served to highlight inequalities of wealth, led the British government to attempt a solution to the problem and the development of indigenous political parties. The riots led the British government to commission the Moyne Report and publish an economic plan for Jamaica. The Moyne Commission concluded that the region should not engage in industrial activity since it lacked raw materials, capital, and industrial skills, and the domestic market was too small and fragment fragmented to support large-scale industrial production. 
Both the report and plan were severely criticized by Lewis. Lewis acknowledged that the report and plan stated that positive measures to raise the standard of living in the colonies should have priority. Lewis, however, argued that it is necessary to distinguish between social welfare and economic development. Lewis felt, and I quote, the principal object of colony policy should be to engage the colonies to stand on their own legs as soon as possible. This can only be done through rapid economic development. What did Lewis propose? In his critique of the Moyne Commission, Lewis outlined a strategy for industrial development for Jamaica based on his review of, industrial, of the industrial development experience of Puerto Rico. Lewis advocated the need for industrial development using local raw materials, including sugar refining, chocolate making, and dairy products. His paper, Industrialization of the British West Indies, provided a fully articulated framework for ca capitalist industrial development in the Caribbean. These works helped Lewis generate a more general model of economic development in his paper, Economic Development with Unlimited Supplies of Labor, which eventually led to him receiving the Nobel Prize in Economics. In Lewis's critique of the Moyne Commission, an economic plan for Jamaica, he stated that he stated that industrialization should be based on the use of local natural resources. Lewis identified small, the small size of local markets, scarcity of domestic capital, and limited marketing skills as the main obstacles to diversification in the Caribbean. He proposed that in order to overcome these barriers, Caribbean countries should attract foreign firms to overcome problems of capital scarcity and poor marketing skills and export to international markets and form a customs union to take advantage of economies of skill and overcome problems associated with small size. Based on the experience of Puerto Rico, Lewis stated that great emphasis should be placed on foreign investment and the granting of fiscal incentives. How closely has Caribbean development policies aligned with Lewis? Industrial development in the Caribbean has been influenced by the ideas of Lewis. However, some important elements of his strategy have not been pursued. Rather than adopt a unified approach to industrial development in the context of a customs union and diversification by export promotion, each Caribbean country pursued a national rather than a regional development plan and initially implemented policies of import substitution industrialization. Also, true regional integration in terms of the free movement of the factors of production is still not a reality in the region today. Given the high specialization in agriculture, when English-speaking Caribbean countries gained independence in the 1960s, Diversification into a manufacturing sector was the primary development strategy adopted. Political leaders saw Lewis's strategy as a vehicle for overcoming vast unemployment problems facing their countries. A combination of government policy and institutional changes were adopted. Development institutions and industrial estates were formed and fiscal and trade incentives instituted to attract foreign investment and to encourage multinational corporations and local capitalists to set up industrial plants. Extra regional trade agreements were, en were entered into to boost international trade. Among the incentives in introduced were tax holidays, subsidies, credit schemes, and tariff protection. In 1968, initial steps at regional integration were taken with the establishment of CARIFTA, the Caribbean Free Trade Area, which was a standard regional free trade agreement. Regional integration was given a further boost by the replacement of CARIFTA with the Caribbean Community and Common Market, CARICOM, in 1972, and the CARICOM Single Market and Economy in 1989. 
In the 1970s and 80s, a further attempt to increase manufactured exports resulted in market-oriented policies, which included trade liberalization and privatization, and the setting up of export-processing zones. Governments also provided many incentives to attract foreign investment. The region also began to enter into a series of extra-regional trade agreements in an effort to diversify. The Lomé Convention was the first such agreement entered into in 1975, which has since been replaced by the Cotonou Agreement in 2000 and the most recent uh, revision, the Economic Partnership Agreement. These agreements provide agriculture producers in the region with guaranteed access to markets in Europe with preferential prices. The Korean Basin Initiative was another major agreement. It was designed to promote manufactured exports in the region, set up in 1982 encouraging U.S. firms to set up in the Caribbean. Similarly, the Canada enacted the Caribbean-Canada Trade Agreement in 1986, which also provide, provided free trade access to Commonwealth Caribbean countries. In more recent times, governments have created national development plans and strategies in the Caribbean. There is Trinidad and Tobago's Vision 2030, Jamaica's 2030 National Development Plan, Grenada's Strategic Development Plan 2030 and Barbados Growth and Development Strategy 2013-2020. While these plans may have been extended to include and place emphasis on additional aspects of development, such as good governance, building a competitive private sector and innovation, protection of the environment, climate change and disaster risk management, human resource and social development, they also can continue to focus heavily on Lewis's core tenant of diversifying into new areas for increasing employment and growth. What does the empirical evidence show on the diversification experience of the Caribbean? Despite the large number of policies and plans implemented, the empirical evidence shows that Caribbean diversification still remains limited today. During colonial times, the colonial authorities developed light manufacturing industries and small-scale production for domestic consumption, such as the processing of local raw materials to make rum, bread, biscuits, clothing, edible oils, and cigarettes, etc. Diversification was not given priority since the sole purpose of the region was to produce agriculture exports to e agriculture products to export to the imperial powers, which were then processed and re-export. Following independence, Caribbean economy's central goal was diversification into a manufacturing sector. And the results indicate while diversification has been limited, some diversification has taken place and three types of products can be looked at. Increasing exports of existing products, increasing exports of new products that is new to the region but not new to the world, increasing exports of innovative products that is, in, that is new to the region and new to the world. What these indicators show is that diversification after independence took place mainly in manufacturing compared to agriculture. Disaggregated data on the services sector to investigate diversification is not easily available, and I therefore do not look at this. Caribbean diversification mainly resulted from existing products, that is, a more equally spread basket of our existed goods. While diversification by new products to the region, but not new to the world, did occur, but it played a relatively smaller role. Existing and new manufactured products, which the Caribbean diversified towards, can be described as low and medium skill intensive manufacturers, rather than high skill intensive manufacturers. In other words, the manufactured products that the region diversified into are low value added, low margin products. Looking at innovative products, since the 1960s, we have diversified into some innovative products that, is, that are products that are new to the Caribbean and new to the world, these innovations occur mainly in resource-intensive manufacturers. However, innovation also occur, but to a lower extent, in high-skill manufacturers and in agriculture. This shows that innovation in the region 
is not occurring primarily in tech and dynamic sectors, but rather in our resource intensive manufacturers. So in looking at Lewis today, many of the strategies he proposed are still useful in promoting diversification. And some of these are to utilize local resources where possible and create backward and forward linkages with other sectors of the economy, to focus on the international export market with an emphasis on international niche marketing and to develop internationally competitive products, to establish strategic alliances with international foreign industrialists given the region's narrow resource base and limited bargaining power, to engage in human resource development to match the technological changes taking place in the manufacturing sector, regional integration to support the region's export drive, and governments should design and implement appropriate policy measures and establish the institutional framework and social infrastructure needed to facilitate the industrialization process. So in closing, Lewis's legacy as an economist lives on not just in his policy prescriptions, but also in two fundamental contributions he made to the field of development economics. Development economics was an emergent field when Lewis published Economic Development with Unlimited Supplies of Labor in 1954. In this single article, he made two fundamental contributions to the emergence of development economics as an academic discipline. Firstly, was to present development economics as a policy science concerned with the problems of economic underdevelopment and low standards of living for the majority of the world's population. Lewis described his work as, and I quote, not primarily an essay in the history of the economic doctrine. I will not therefore spend time on individual writers inquiring what they meant or assessing its validity or truth. Our purpose is rather to bring their framework up to date in the light of modern knowledge and to see how far it then helps us to understand the contemporary problems of large areas of the earth. In his second contribution to, devel to development economics was the emphasis on development as a multidimensional process of economic, political, social, and institutional change. Based on Lewis and Lewis's understanding of economic history, and his own experience in the West Indies, he was fully aware of the ways in which the complex interactions between economic, social, and political forces could help and hinder the, the development process. And he made many references to this in his work. He makes a point in, in his 1954 article, behind this analysis lies the sociological problem of the emergence of a capitalist class. In another quote, he states, Government affect the process of capital accumulation in many ways. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, join, join us. Thank you, Godfrey. Uh, again, Dr. Godfrey Saint Bernard, Dr. Talia Esnar, Dr. Hamid Ghani, and Dr. Priyan Mohan for these enlightening presentations. Dr. Godfrey Saint Bernard. Thank you for the uh, thought-provoking presentation on the transition dynamics and the implications for that moving forward. Uh, Dr. Talia Esnard for sharing the source of inspiration for a lot of your current work that is being done, and Sir Arthur Lewis so I mean the backdrop for that and your conversations with Sir Arthur Lewis. Dr. Ghani for your bringing to life the discussions between Lewis and uh, so, and, and Eric, Dr. Eric Williams, in the whole uh, surrounding that issue of consociationalism, and uh, Dr. Mohan for the bringing to bear the implications for development moving forward, as well as the uh, issue of diversification. And I can, and I think we would you know, all agree. First of all, join me in thanking the panelists for their their presentations. And I think we can all agree that the writings of Lewis is certainly multidisciplinary in nature. As you can see, it spans a number of uh, different areas um, as seen by the presentations. And the other most outstanding feature is that a lot of Lewis's work remains very relevant for a lot of our discussions and as a region uh, moving forward uh, even today. So. At this point, I would like to now invite questions um, from the audience. 
and I would like us to bear in mind that we have some microphones, I think, and also bear in mind that there may be others who would be waiting to ask questions, so if we can be as uh, succinct and concise with our questions as possible, as well as if we have comments and can direct them to the panelists. So now we will open up for members of the audience. Good afternoon. Um, Keston Perry is my name, and I thank you for the very interesting presentations. I um, was particularly moved by the conversation um, by Dr. Inad. Um, between herself, I guess, and Lewis as a, a mentor in absentia. Um, I have a, a couple questions. Um, with, with respect to um, Dr. St. Bernard's presentation, when I looked at the unemployment data for much of the Caribbean, um, sort of ranging from between Trinidad and Tobago is around 5%, um, probably expected to increase and up to about 17% in Guyana, Haiti, and so on. How does that chime with um, your discussion around advanced, um, the, the advanced demographic transition, what you explain, that we would be in a position to import labor and, and, or absorb foreign labor? Um, I wasn't too sure how that, that is working, especially in, in the context of the Caribbean being the largest exporter of skilled labor, especially to OECD countries. So perhaps if you might want to give a comment on that. And um, Dr. Ghani, I was wondering whether or not we might actually start thinking about Lewis, instead of being a, a, an economist who is generous, but a political economist, because I guess his last job, because he's, he became a political philosopher to some extent, as you mentioned, um, but he also used economic sort of ideas to explain some of these things. So uh, it's, there's a very different, there's a difference, I think, in sort of political scientists and economists, and I, I wonder if we could bring them two together in sort of considering Lewis. Um, and finally, um, Dr. Mohan, I was not um, entirely convinced um, with respect to, I was wondering whether you used export as a proxy or export value or output value in terms of, you mentioned that we have moved towards manufacturing, but from what I have sort of looked, um, you don't see in terms of GDP large manufacturing output. So perhaps you might be able to clarify that a bit. Thanks. Take a couple more questions if we have any. Um. Thank, you. thank you very much. Hello, uh, thank you. My name is Mahadev Basun, and um, the observation I'd like to make uh, and invite a response is that uh, we are much more about society than economics. Uh, to talk about economics, is sort of like uh, putting the cart before the horse. Uh, there's another remediation work that we need to do right here. Uh, our society uh, is in shambles. And our schooling is colonial and over 100 years old. And uh, these are things we ought to address. Now, also in terms of innovation inside a society, because society makes itself and is obligated to invent and reinvent itself. Things don't stay the same. Static societies become defenseless. As you see with native peoples all over the world, they're destroyed. Uh, unwittingly or wittingly, uh, powerful people go to work. And the, the, <laughs> the classic example, like I'm talking all about, think about Nauru. Uh, the, <laughs> the way Nauru has gone uh, is shocking. And anybody who's depending on the exploitation of resources by outsiders who have money, power, and guns. They have it. You cannot speak to people with guns. They have them hidden in their back pockets. And this is the kind of world we live in. Uh, I need to uh, also uh, raise uh, uh, a line out of Dr. Ghani's uh, article, where he says that we, in order to industrialize, we'll have to, I was going to use a crude expression, uh, bow, and, bow and scrape. 
perhaps is a better way of putting it. Nobody's ever going to come here to fix Trinidad. They're going to come here to see what they can get. And we are in no position really to negotiate with them often because we are so needy. We are on our knees. And they may dictate. I'm not, I have not been inside the, uh, the uh, negotiating places when a lot of outsiders come here with bags of money. And uh, we're afraid that they'll walk away with their money. <laughs> uh, I don't know how we, what kind of terms. I look at Guyana right now, for example, and wonder whether Guyana is going to really benefit from people coming there to, to drill the oil and gas, and whether they can negotiate. Because they've been begging for a long time, and they're terribly, terribly confused people who have destroyed themselves. They can't move. Same thing may be said about Trinidad. Excuse me, sir. In the interest of time, so yes. that we Thanks. can get more questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank I cut you. it short. All right. So I'm saying society. I'm saying we need to identify uh, where we can strengthen our society, not just talk about it. We have to look at schooling. When we talk about innovation, we don't have to speak about uh, a mega project. We are a small country. SIDS is what we are. And there are benefits from integrating with Jamaica and Barbados and all the rest of us. Belize too. But Belize is in much more of a needy place than we are. They are about 50 years backward in terms of technology. So uh, we really need to stop textbooking and open our eyes and go among our people and work with them. All right. See what's on the ground, what's real. Thank you for your okay. contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'd now like to invite the panelists to address uh, some of the questions or comments raised in the order of some of them that were asked. Okay, um, I guess I can respond to the question that was directed at me. And yes, the colleague was correct about, you know, the variable unemployment rates in Caribbean societies. But I would continue to state that a current tenet in all the work that I have done is one where when we focus on development, and I emphasize the importance of Lewis's work from the standpoint of economic development. Today we talk about sustainable development. What I really am somewhat disgusted by is the fact that a lot of development practitioners actually focus on events and outcomes that have already happened when they talk about development. And development is not about, being react, uh, not about being reactive, but it is about being proactive. So when I make statements about you know, the prospect of um, an increased influx of immigrants into Caribbean societies, including Trinidad and Tobago, it is that proactive vision that I am reinforcing, the fact that you have to look at population dynamics. When we talk about development, it is about the people, and we have to have a sense as to what the numbers would look like into the future. Development is about the future. And as I said, come 2020, given current population projections, somewhere in the 2020s, Trinidad and Tobago's population will plateau. We will perhaps never experience 1.4 million people in this country, and it's going to go right back down with a ton of persons, 65 plus, as many as 20 to 25 percent of our population could be in that age group, and much fewer in younger age groups. And by the time retirement sets in, if we don't ex increase the age of retirement, you're going to have a labor force that is going to be screaming for people. And we aren't really doing much for young people right now. There are many young people we sent to university tell them go to university and your life would be nice and rosy and dandy, and many of them are unemployed and underemployed and continues to be unemployed and underemployed, and they will become that massive reserve army to be exploited by people who have the capital and are likely to come here and develop